Hello from Manila and welcome to the latest Asian Impact webinar from the Asian Development Bank. We launched today a book titled Debt, The Sustainability of Asia's Debt, Problems, Policies and Practices that ADB co-publishes with Edward Elgar. 24 scholars and practitioners wrote this book for a total of 16 chapters plus an overview and synthesis. The book covers a broad range of topics that have long been of relevance to the region and beyond and it provides an early reckoning of this pandemic's impact on government finances across the region. To discuss this timely publication, uh, it is a privilege having four of the book's authors on the panel. Farah Imrana Hussein is Senior Financial Officer and Sustainable Finance Specialist at the Capital Markets and Investment Department of the World Bank Treasury. Examples of Farah's vast work and technical assistance for sustainable financing are Malaysia's issuance of the first green sukuk in the world, that is uh, essentially an Islamic uh, bond-like instrument, the first corporate green bonds and regulations in Indonesia, and the development of the ASEAN green bond guidelines. Farah contributed a chapter to the book we are launching today, indeed on the topic of so-called thematic bonds with a special focus on Asia. Lili Liu is former global lead of inter intergovernmental finance at the World Bank and served on the World Bank urban and transport sector boards with extensive publications and policy and operational work on fiscal adjustments, subnational debt restructuring, infrastructure financing, and capital market development. Lili is also a contributing author to the book we are launching today with a chapter on subnational debt. Juan Pradelli, is a senior expert in fiscal policy and debt management, formerly staff of the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. He has worked as advisor or consultant with international financial institutions and government agencies all over the world, typically in support of debt management and fiscal and public financial management reforms, and helping countries with setting up fiscal policy units and debt management offices. Juan is an author and co-editor of this ADB book. Marcelo Giugale, is professor at Georgetown University and a former director of country, regional, and global departments at the World Bank. Until recently, he led the World Bank's Department of Financial Advisory and Banking Services, helping emerging and developing countries manage their reserves, lighten their debts, and hedge their risks. Marcelo is co-editor of this ADB book, and the project benefited enormously from his wealth of insights and generous contributions from the conception stage to this very day. We want to make this a lively uh, discussion. We want to hear from you, the audience. So please do type in your questions in the Q&A box you find at the bottom or the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, please do give the thumbs up or like existing questions so that we will address the most popular questions first. Let me give the floor now to Marcelo for his presentation. Thank you very much, Beno. Uh, allow me to start by expressing publicly my appreciation to you and to ADB for inviting me to be part of this book initiative. I have to say your strategic timing is impeccable. Um, there is no question that debt sustainability will be the dominant overarching global macroeconomic issue in the post-pandemic world. And Asia will probably not escape that new reality. Uh, having had the pleasure of working with, as you mentioned, 24 authors on 16 chapters, chapters that span very widely through countries, themes, and policies, uh, I would like to share with you right away what I think are the main messages running across all these chapters, and then leave you with the lessons that I think this region is teaching all of us, and certainly other women of the world. I will do that, if you allow me, with only two slides and one image in 15 minutes. So let me go right away onto this slide, um, which I will show for you. Um, what are these messages that the book is giving us when you look across chapters? And the first one is very simple. Um, there. Uh, whether one looks across countries, 
in the entire region is vast diversity. At group of countries by income level, by geography, or even at individual economies, there is no question that Asia has been borrowing fast, extremely fast. And this is true whether the debtors are governments, corporations, households, subnationals, everybody tap finance with gusto. Uh, the debt burdens, at least the old measurement of debt as proportion of GDP, which we use in the book, grew large for almost all countries and at times massive. And that was before the pandemic. The pandemic made it all a lot worse. Now, the second message, um, which is rather surprising, is that for a number of reasons, all that debt seems sustainable, at least for now. Uh, what are those reasons to make such a big, growing, heavy debt that is about to be worse uh, remaining sustainable? Well, there is a variety of those reasons. The first is that learning from past crises, both high and middle income countries in the region developed their domestic capital markets and gradually shifted to that domestic capital market, most, if not all, public borrowing. Another reason is that some countries did undertake painful structural reform, and some are still doing that, particularly in those areas where there is debt generation at play, for example, price subsidies. You should also say that donors, particularly bilaterals, have been particularly generous with the lower income and island states countries in the region. And finally, global investors still bet on the region, still see it as a safe bet, particularly while interest rates are close to zero. We'll see what happens when that changes. So you have some reasons to say, uh, you have some reasons to say why this heavy debt is still sustainable, at least for now. Uh, but sustainable doesn't mean riskless. Behind these causes of comfort, there are significant dangers that policymakers should keep in mind. The first that the book documents very well is that fiscal space, the capacity to accommodate unexpected expenditures in financially sound way, that fiscal space has been shrinking and is projected to continue shrinking. Uh, it's very difficult to see if the region doesn't come back to its trademark rapid growth trend. It's difficult to see how the reconstruction and the recovery will be funded, but there is no much fiscal space to, space to speak of. The second risk is contingent liabilities, no question about that, meaning by necessity or by law, governments are or are expected to be responsible for liabilities that sometimes dwarf their own debts, whether they are coming from the financial sector, from SOEs, from subnationals, contingent liabilities remain a problem. Asia. And finally, one more risk that we call it the debt equivalent to an elephant in the room, and this is Asia. East Asia is growing old so quickly that short of major reforms and all technological miracles, never know, the public debt of these countries in East Asia uh, will be multiples of their current levels, which are already uh, and the search will be only 20 years away. This is not next century. This is in about 15 to 20 years. Um, of course, all this risk management assumes that you can forecast uh, both fiscal accounts, particularly public debt um, and budget with some accuracy. And our analysis of the accuracy of forecast of fiscal accounts and public debt has shown us that Asia is not worse than other regions, but it's still incredibly unpredictable, even one or two years out. So planning, fiscal planning, is particularly tricky when you don't have the capacity to forecast with accuracy. So you have a very heavy debt burden that is growing fast, that is risky, that is sustainable today, but may not be sustainable in the near future. 
what should you do as a policy maker? And the to-do list for us is rather simple. He says, build on your successes to tackle the long pending reforms and start hedging your risks. Use the new instruments that are at your disposal to hedge new risks. Um, as I mentioned before, the region's public debt managers and in general financial sector managers have much to be proud of. Their efforts are developed in the domestic capital market has become an asset. Uh, and it should be further, it should be nature, and it should be extended to other lagging countries that have not done the same. Uh, those same managers, to their credit, are beginning to wrestle with contingent attributes, mostly at the moment by identifying, quantifying, and uh, publishing, showing them, making them explicit. And these people have also started creating a national awareness about the cost and realism of price subsidies and social, and social security promises. All that is very welcome, but the time to really act on all this uh, has come, it's now. Now, looking forward, fiscal risk, whether it's natural disasters, operational risk, financial sector risk, commodity price volatility, uh, all those risks um, are very capable of derailing the fiscal path of most of the region's countries. Um, it shouldn't be like that, because at the moment, you can buy insurance and hedge yourself against all those risks, whether you buy the policies or the contracts from investors or from multilaterals, those are available. Equally important, you now have alternative sources of finance. Uh, you can tap the impact uh, investor community, something that corporations uh, and state-owned enterprises have done, but government have not, particularly in the area of thematic bonds, whether they are green or blue, this is something that um, policymakers have not yet done. Of course, all these tools are not for everyone. And there are differences in financial standing and institutional capacity, but the menu is ample enough um, to work within it. So that's the thrust of what the book is saying for us. Let me work now the lessons. What have we learned that can be useful for others? Uh, I have seven lessons, um, I will go quick. The first is that Japan's public debt magic, magic is probably irreplicable elsewhere. This ability to carry a public debt burden that is more than twice the size of your GDP and growing fast, and even that make getting faster with the pandemic, uh, almost all of it in local currency, and still face a nominal interest rate uh, that even corrected by inflation is lower than your projected growth rate. Uh, that's not for everyone. Not everybody is that lucky. I confess the team did not come to consensus as to whether there is a home bias in Japan that is quite unique to Japan. Um, one potential piece of evidence in favor of those that believe there is a home bias is the amazing confidence that the Japanese have in the Japanese yen. Uh, if you look at M1, meaning the measure of liquidity divided by GDP before the pandemic, it was already 160% of GDP. To give an idea, in a normal European country, 40s, 50s, the US is in the 20s. So it's a world record for a country that has no financial repression of capital controls. So there is something there very specific to Japan, first lesson. Second lesson is that China's ability to use public non-financial corporate borrowing as a tool for macroeconomic management is also probably is a pick. Uh, the numbers are truly staggering. Uh, the country's total debt soared from 141% of GDP in 2008, just before Lehman collapsed and triggered the global financial crisis, from 141 to 243% of GDP by the end of 2019, just before the pandemic came. Uh, this is approximately a $30 trillion jump that's equivalent to a third of the global, uh, the world's GDP. And when you look at it, every sector borrowed, uh, 
this idea that everyone borrows with gusto, that applies squarely to China. Uh, but by far, by far, the main driver of Chinese debt accumulation have been non-financial corporations. Uh, if you look at them in the past 12 years, the liability rose by more than 50 percentage points of GDP to reach now 150 percent of GDP. Um, those are very, very large numbers. Now, when you dig deeper, and our authors did, they actually look at 4 million Chinese uh, industrial companies. You find that there are two very specific characteristics to the accumulation of debt in China. The first characteristic is that it's very highly concentrated in a very small fraction of firms, maybe less than a thousand, which happen to be very large, state controlled, and listed in the stock exchange. In contrast, the rest of the corporate sector has been delivered uh, up to the pandemic, uh, particularly they share as they should, short-term debt. The second mark that makes this very specific to China this corporate ballooning corporate borrowing is that almost all is this debt is owed to local state-owned banks, not to bondholders. The securitization move is quite recent, big picture of things, um, which means that the commercial fate of those companies is linked to individual depositors and the claims have very limited, very limited tradability. Okay. It's a very solid piece of, of tradability. Now, of course, the Chinese policymakers understood this very early, um, and they understood the systemic implications of having such an accumulation at the core of the country's corporate sector. Their response was launched back in November 2015 in the program that became known as the supply side structural reforms. The idea was to expose all these indebted corporations to the discipline markets, specifically of consumers, creditors, and competitors. At the same time, they were cutting lifelines for firms that were clearly unviable, what we call the zombie, zombie firms, zombie corporations, and they were allowing them to go out through bankruptcy. That reform was moving, and along comes the pandemic. And it hit China very hard, very quickly. The government was very right, and very quickly imposed quarantines and lockdowns. But that made GDP tumble to the tone of 7% uh, in the first, or year on year, in the first quarter of 2020. So the government, like all governments in the world, responded with unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus. Uh, everything was on the, on the menu, tax cuts, cheap loans, um, targeted loans, uh, even consumer vouchers were at play. Um, new bonds were issued for infrastructure by local authorities. It was a push to do that. Now, all these saved the economy in the short term. But clearly, this emergency, emergency, emergency corporate lifeline. Uh, go against the grains of the supply side structural reforms that were needed to deleverage that core corporate sector. So today, whether the reforms are quickly resumed, are suspended for a while, or are abandoned forever, will determine whether China's debt problem returns to a path towards sustainability or they don't. Third lesson is that the 21 Asian lower income countries that qualify for the G20's DSSI, is the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, will anyway be engaged in debt relief and debt workouts for several years to come. Uh, in a way, developing Asia never did what emerging Asia did after the crisis of the mid-1990s. It did not switch the marginal source of finance from foreign to domestic currency, from foreign markets to domestic markets. It probably couldn't because those markets were too small or too underdeveloped. The good news there is that the debt of these 21 countries is mostly uh, owned to official lenders, as multilaterals or non-Paris club lenders. 
but mostly it doesn't mean exclusively. You still have there private creditors and you have bondholders. Now, once you have bondholders, the bail in, bail out problem triggers. Uh, and the DSSI common framework hasn't been able to resolve that bailout problem. So down the road, the only way to break free from this will be concessionality. Uh, and it will be concessionality for a long time. So dialogue around this and negotiations will be at play. Fourth lesson, and I go fast, is from the point of view of debt management, the Pacific, since God is not the Caribbean. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, with the exception of Fiji and PNG, uh, which did tap international bond markets, although briefly and a few times, these sub-regions, these Pacific islands, are in extreme dependency from dollars. Um, and that, in a way, has shielded all of them from the volatility of global finance. Now, we calculate in the corresponding chapter that with a doable fiscal effort and continuing donor support, the Pacific should remain uh, on a sustainable debt path. Now, the Caribbean does not have general donors, uh, and the fiscal efforts that we're talking about are monumental in terms. Uh, I'm thinking Jamaica here. So very different cases from one sub-region to the other. Uh, at the same time, I would say that fiscal federalism has not yet complicated Asia's debt, as it has complicated, for example, Latin America. And it is not likely to do so. The idea of a subnational government borrowing independently without any regulation from the central authorities, like they did in Brazil in the 90s and until the 2000s, uh, has not happened yet in Asia and is unlikely to happen. The political structure is just very different. Uh, and we have seen that in India, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, um, even China, its local capital market highly controlled by the central government, if not the jury, the fact. Uh, sixth lesson I want to leave you with is uh, why public debt management has become world-class in emerging Asia, fiscal risk, risk management uh, has not. As I mentioned before, the region is yet to rein in contingent liabilities, hedge against natural disasters, which is very prone, uh, and commodity price risk and face, of course, the forthcoming uh, aging crisis problem. Uh, markets, however, are very sanguinary. Uh, however, the reforms that need to be carried out are not easy. We are talking about removing price subsidies, buying insurance, uh, and undoing or reforming social security systems. Final lesson is that Asia's private and state-owned enterprises have been quick to adopt and lead on impact finance, especially thematic bonds, green, social, gender. And governments have not. Um, why? Well, likely because they don't feel that they need to diversify any further their lending sources. As I mentioned, the market has been generous to them, particularly the domestic market. Uh, they trust the amplitude of the domestic markets. Uh, or it may be that the additional scrutiny uh, that the promise on the use of proceeds brings is not yet welcome. Which of the two reasons it is, um, only time will tell. So let me conclude uh, by doing something that people ask me all the time when I make presentations like this. There's always one person that says, Could you please tell me the whole book? in four or five words. Could you just give me the bumper sticker? So I force myself every time to create the bumper sticker. Uh, and for this book, I did. So here is a bumper sticker for our book. Asia's debt, sustainable for now. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, Marcelo. Notwithstanding the time limits we gave you, you managed to, to really bring across the, the highlights of this, of this vast, vast book. Um, let me now, before we uh, take some of, the, some of the questions I see popping up already, 
uh, let me uh, go to each of the panelists uh, just briefly for, for a first reaction. Now, Marcelo, you, you, you finished off, uh, I think, the seventh of the les lessons you mentioned about thematic bonds and founding opportunities. Um, uh, Farah, uh, can you tell us uh, more about uh, how these instruments can support government and corporate debt sustainability in Asia? And, and what needs to happen for more governments in Asia to actually issue such uh, bonds? beyond the, the handful of uh, countries that have done so already. Hi, Benno. Um, let me first thank you and the Asian Development Bank for inviting me to participate in this panel discussion. And of course, also to co contribute to this uh, book. Uh, and let me also take the opportunity to congratulate uh, the editors, the Asian Development Bank and my fellow authors uh, for, for this seminal um, publication. Um, so I work uh, with uh, um, emerging market uh, sovereigns mainly on sustainable finance, facilitating green, social and sustainable bonds. Um, and um, I can tell you that there is tremendous opportunity um, in uh, issuing these types of bonds by, uh, by governments who wish to uh, finance their environmental and social priorities and want to tap institutional investors who are integrating environmental, social, and governance factors in their investment decisions. Um, the amount of impact investing resources has been growing uh, tremendously over the last five years. By some estimates, um, you know, $26 trillion um, in the next uh, 30 years um, are going to be invested in impact investments. Um, and by some uh, estimates, one in $4 uh, in assets under management are already being invested in uh, impact uh, investments. So there is tremendous opportunity for Asian governments, especially those um, who um, want to issue well-designed and credible uh, transactions, green and, and social bonds. Uh, that will finance projects which are um, focused not just on local priorities, but also the global public goods, environmental and social priorities. Um, there, there is going to be tremendous appetite from, uh, from investors. Um, and, and we're seeing that these investors are not just the global investors, not just those who are in Europe, but Asian institutional investors are also integrating ESG in their investment decisions. Uh, and there is uh, tremendous interest um, and governments and especially public debt managers that want to diversify their, um, their in investor um, sources, uh, want to expand their investor uh, base and uh, potentially lower their financing costs, would want to tap these uh, investors with these types of transactions, green social and, and sustainability bonds. But of course, you know, these types of uh, bonds, they are also debt, just like conventional debt. Uh, they also add to the, to the uh, debt burden. Uh, so just like any other conventional bonds, when these uh, types of bonds are, uh, are issued, we have to make sure um, that uh, they're consistent with fiscal spending and deficit uh, plans so that they don't, um, uh, you know, add or they don't take a, a country to an unsustainable debt path. Over to you, Benno. Thank you very much, Farah, for these insights. So a, a broadening of, of uh, sources of financing to counter some of the challenges uh, parts of this region is meeting with capital flows that are partly drying up. Uh, and some of the challenges that I believe also Juan, you have been uh, highlighting in going through the uh, debt ratios and, and, and data across the region. Um, you worked with us on projections uh, on debt ratios across Asia, and together we have provided debt analytical and management support to many countries as well. Tell us, without zooming in on any one country in particular, what are the most salient risks and challenges of late? Thank you very much, Beno. As my colleagues uh, did, I would like to thank ADB, uh, Economic and Regional Cooperation Department, for inviting me to this seminar, also for um, uh, giving me a chance to uh, join the debt, sustain 
the Sustainability in Asia book as a co-editor and author. And of course, I want to thank all the participants to this workshop today, the time you are spending with us and your interest in this conversation. I think that um, our empirical analysis of the debt situation uh, all across Asia uh, that is part of the book highlights that uh, vulnerabilities are of pretty different type across regions, uh, across countries that have different um, levels of debt and, um, and, and financing needs in the short to medium term. It, the vulnerabilities are also very different depending on the capacity the governments have to uh, uh, manage their debts. And, and I would also add that the fiscal conditions and the global conditions right now are also an important, uh, important factors to consider. When we close the chapters uh, and, and the book started the, to, to, to be the, 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 the publication process, uh, what it were, were about the beginning, uh, quarter one, quarter two of 2021. And since then, things and risk have changed a lot. Uh, one of the messages of the book, the positive one, was that some countries will be able to handle high levels of, of debt um, thanks to uh, the, at that time, uh, still expansionary monetary conditions in the global economy. And that has changed significantly. We are starting to see a supply disruptions that are um, raising inflation in advanced economies and central banks in, in, in those economies are starting to consider tightening fiscal policy. This will certainly bring uh, a financial risk for several countries in Asia that have exposure to uh, refinancing risks that have a significant maturities of external bonds, external securities in the short to medium term. In addition to that, we still have very significant geopolitical risks, uh, just as, as we speak, uh, problems in, in Ukraine and, and before that in months ago in Europe brought the global energy markets to a very um, unusual situation. And this has a direct impact on the external and fiscal uh, situations of countries that are heavily dependent on certain uh, commodities like oil which by the way is, is, is a characteristic that dependency uh, is, is a fact, an important factor in, in several Asian countries. Um, so that's another uh, risk that we have to consider. And then I'll, I would like to finally emphasize that the, in the historical experience, when one looks at those papers that review the um, the debt, the public debt phenomenon over extended periods of time, we learn that in most of the, um, the, the, the events that led to very high levels of debt, like wars or global financial crisis, it was economic growth that in the medium to long term helped the countries to reduce the debt burdens. Now, the growth prospects as we look ahead are quite, uh, uncertain. In the uh, very short term, the pandemic is not over as we would like. There are new variants coming in. We have uh, spikes of um, uh, cases in certain countries. Uh, by the time we were starting to publish the book, we thought that the pandemic would be over. And unfortunately, it's still with us and it's bringing um, economic risk in the medium term, in the, in the, in the short term. Uh, in the medium term, we have to recognize that global growth was decelerating, particularly because of um, large economies like China, even prior to the pandemic. And that growth deceleration will continue in the, in the medium term. So growth cannot make the trick as it used to. And finally, in the long term, we have the problem that uh, Marcelo highlighted concerning aging. Aging is, uh, will create pressures towards further growth deceleration. So, after the pandemic, we are no longer in the sort of um, global events uh, experience in the past in which economic growth helped uh, the countries manage and, and reduce the debt burdens. So I think that economic policies will be much more important this time around. And I think the book provides several insights 
of what governments can do, particularly concerning debt policy and debt management, but also with some reference, important reference to fiscal policies in order to cope with this um, uh, legacy of the pandemic, namely high levels of debt. Thank you, Benno. Back to you. Thanks, Juan. So governments demanded to do. We also have in the book a chapter on a subnational uh, focus. So, uh, you know, before we go to, to questions from the audience, Lily, um, subnational entities are said to be key to delivering Asia's post-COVID recovery as well, efforts, as well as public infrastructure and other spending that will be crucial towards achieving the SDGs. They will need to borrow. How can Asian countries enable subnational borrowing that's conducive to development without sharpening debt sustainability concerns, particularly in those countries where they exist already? Thank you, Benno. Uh, that's a very good question. And I want to second other panelists uh, to thank Asian Development Bank for having me as part of this project. Uh, basically, the subnational borrowing, subnational debt market is very uh, necessitated by immense infra infrastructure financing needs. And uh, according to Asian Development Bank, Asia needs to invest $1.7 trillion equivalent per year uh, by 2030. And then when we talk about the market development, it's always a very complex and very long process and involve uh, each country's starting point and its own system. And when we talk about market and uh, subnational borrowing, we have two players, one is the Substantial government is borrowers, the other is credit, creditors from the market side. On the borrower side, the intergovernment fiscal system uh, is very important. And, and I think that the, 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 when this immense needs uh, call for uh, uh, substantial borrowing and developing the market, at the same time, many countries are going through uh, changes in intergovernment fiscal system, delegating Subnational government to have a responsibility for infrastructure. Do they have the capacity for project planning, capital budgeting? On the revenue side, to have a dedicated revenue source to service the debt is very fundamental to the sustainability of debt. And that will involve whole complex issues of reforming VAT, personal income tax, capital, uh, corporate income tax, sales tax, uh, property tax, uh, as well as the intergovernment fiscal transfer system. And then many countries are going through uh, the changes to the fiscal transfer system, which was also challenges stability uh, and, and the transparency or clarity of, of the revenues the subnational government can use to service the debt. From the market perspective, and also Marcelo alluded to the issue of fiscal space. If a, if a country already has a very high sovereign debt, over 100% of GDP, then the room for subnational borrowing will be very much constrained. Uh, and this has become particularly challenging for in the post-COVID world. Um, and from the market side, there's the market regulation, securities regulation, competition to encourage mutual fund life insurance company and pensions to participate as a credit supply. And also uh, credit ratings, dealers, the entire infrastructure of, of the uh, fixed income securities has to be developed. And I think a country will be well positioned to have a uh, step up in development if the sovereign debt market is already pretty maturing uh, and the corporate debt market is, is vibrant. That will pave a very good foundation for sovereign government to build on that capacity and market infrastructure. And I think fundamentally, probably the most important issue in subnational debt disability and utilize effectively the market to finance infrastructure is inherent uh, problem of moral hazard. That, that whether the, the credit, creditors and, and borrowers would depend on the bailout, have this bailout expectation, uh, either from borrower side or from the uh, market side, whether central government will step in if, if the substantial government cannot fulfill its legal obligations uh, of paying the, uh, to service the debt. And that is involved in entire issues of legal remedies, judicial system and debt restructuring process. It's very complex, even for the US, which has a fairly well-developed capital market. It took the Congress four years to develop, to uh, enact um, a bankruptcy law for municipalities. 
and after ex extended the debates in the Congress. In, um, so, um, and finally, I think what's important is really the macro stability that a country's subnational, their credit worth, their credit strength would be capped by the, the rating of subnational debt cannot be higher than the sovereign rating. So if a sovereign government has junk rating, not, not investment grade, that it would be very difficult for sovereign governments to access the capital market uh, for effective financing. So there's a whole range, and also Marcelo mentioned contingent liability issues. And I think that also uh, relate to a financial reporting system, whether there's a clarity in accounting system, in transparency data reporting, so that market can ac uh, assess accurately the default risk of a subnational borrower. So um, this is a whole range of complex issues and the, the research we have done is also based on what we learned from US, from uh, Latin America, from Eastern European countries. And, and, and so the, the, the chapter really tried to summarize uh, some of the key lessons and the development process in, in, Asian, in, in, in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. And I hope our readers will go to your chapter and look at those four countries you delve into, uh, China, India, Indonesia, and Philippines in this region, and where you uh, compare their experiences and progress to date. Now, um, let's look at what we have here, what questions we got. So, now, in terms of popularity, I see one about Oh yeah, mentioning in particular with regard to the Philippines. Well, the book doesn't really zoom in on the Philippines in that regard, but I see there's another popular question that helps us generalize. I think here it's really about the trade-off between the needs, the demand for emergency and recovery spending, fiscal spending and borrowing versus the needs for that sustainability and the maintenance of fiscal space, also in terms of, of crisis. Um, how, to, how to navigate that, that trade-off? Uh, Marcelo uh, first and, and then, then Juan. Uh, thank you, Benoit. And each country, of course, is very specific uh, because the starting point matters. One thing is to speak about countries that have serious debt obligations coming up this year, Sri Lanka, for example. Uh, and a different one is countries that don't have that kind of amortization path, and on top of their debt is mostly domestic. So initial conditions matter. However, there are two trends that will dominate across countries. One is the retrenchment of uh, expenditures, particularly pandemic-related support systems. Uh, fiscal retrenchment has to happen. Um, you know, if countries decide to do payroll protection programs or tax rebates or uh, subsidized loans, all that now has to be retrenched. Um, soon enough, the issue is no longer a viability of demand. Demand is there. Actually, in some countries, there's too much demand and they begin to see inflation. So, it's very difficult to imagine that we're going to stay with six or seven percentage points of GDP in expenditures over the long trend, over the structural value. That number six to seven is more or less what those countries have done. Uh, so we have to prepare for it. Uh, politicians need to understand this. Uh, otherwise, that's complete. You know, it's not just that they explode, they become unsustainable. There's no growth rate. That made them sustainable. The second retrenchment is monetary. Um, you know, here in the US, of course, everybody speaks about uh, the balance sheet of the Fed, you know, from four trillion, nine trillion, you know, in a couple of years. Uh, but that's also happening in the emerging Asia, uh, where the central banks were called to do something very early on, while this fiscal stimuli was implemented, the central banks were called upon very quickly, particularly for countries that were not committed to fiscal chain rates. 
and we have many in the region of Afghanistan now. Um, so that retrenchment will not be painless. We will see it in housing, uh, you know, cost of mortgages. We see it in consumer credit. Uh, portfolios will deteriorate. So we need to prepare our bank supervisors to go through that process. The good news here is that what I'm telling you is box popular. Everybody knows it. Uh, people talk about it. So regulators and policymakers are aware and are doing their best. You know, I think they're trying their best uh, with some success. There will be flare ups, uh, both in island states and some uh, major countries that have been carrying this problem well before the pandemic came. Thank you. Thanks, Marcelo. And Juan, from, from your work in this region, how do you see uh, governments are tackling this trade-off? Yeah, clearly, uh, thanks for the participant for that question. I think uh, that question points to the most important challenging for facing uh, fiscal policymakers uh, in the next few years, namely to balance the need to put the fiscal house in order on the one hand and on the other, make sure that they can support the economic recovery, the domestic economic recovery, when we are still having these uncertainties about what's going to happen with the pandemic, with uh, global supply chain, with inflation, with energy prices, etc. Uh, I, I think that in this um, situation, it's very important for countries to have fiscal strategies, to have plans that could be contingent on uh, circumstances in order to uh, determine which type of revenue and spending measures they need to they need to take those plans should be used as policy communication devices in order to uh, explain uh, the public investors partners what the plans are you know <clears throat> in order to reduce the deficits and contain the growth of debt also making those plans if necessary contingent to the evolution of um, uh, domestic conditions. And for that, there could be some, uh, for instance, financial instruments that can be useful, the instruments conditional, uh, whose, whose payments are conditional on uh, the evolution of the GDP or inflation, um, or, or even there are initiatives to, to link repayments to uh, commodity prices the, that are important as, as a source of revenue for the government in certain countries. This, uh, um, innovative financing instruments should be contemplated. Uh, I also think, that must concur with, with Marcelo, that some uh, deep revisions of um, the spending structure are very necessary in countries we still have in Asia. With, there's many countries that still have significant uh, fuel subsidies, for instance, that clearly we know they are not well targeted, they are not uh, conducive to economic uh, fairness, and they are extremely expensive. So there's opportunity to revise the, um, the structure of spending as well. Then there are many countries also that historically, well before the pandemic, have very um, insufficient levels of uh, domestic taxation. And they had to increase the, the strength of the capacity to mobilize domestic resources even prior to the pandemic. Now that the debt levels are higher and the, in the long term, the servicing of that debt uh, has to be considered, the case to be made in order to be more uh, serious about um, setting the right uh, tax level and structure is, um, is it becomes uh, more important. So I, I think that there were, are a number of fiscal policy decisions that have to be taken. Uh, and uh, well, this is a, a, a fact that um, policymakers will have to deal with. In addition, I think that the international community uh, could also make its contribution. Marcelo was mentioning at the beginning, a very important um, action, the debt service suspension initiative that was taken um, soon after the pandemic made clear it will be very difficult for low-income countries to, um, to handle their financing obligations, the financial obligations together with their economic and, and political obligations to support uh, the, the, the country. But there are still other uh, initiatives that have, that have stagnant actually, 
like the G20 common framework. Uh, this would be this was meant to be a, a, a standard debt relief uh, initiative that has not seen too much progress since it was formulated back in November 2020. I think the, donor, the international community can also facilitate this uh, solution of the fiscal trade-off that we um, were discussing earlier, particularly for low-income countries. Mm -hmm. um, the solution of the way forward is not only about domestic policies, but also global policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Benno, back to you. Thanks. So now let me let me look at uh, another question we we got about uh, spillovers. Um, also, Juan, I, in, we, we find essentially that we don't get huge surprises. Um, countries that entered this latest of crises with high debt ratios they tended to see further rises. Right? Countries that had some structural issues and problems to deal with, uh, they uh, find now. Uh, those those problems most most uh, emerging, so I think this answers some of the questions we get here with regard to specific countries. Uh, but related to that, Farah, maybe may I ask you because you you of course you work with the markets as well. What what is the risk of spillovers from from these cases of heightened risk and and uncertainty uh, regarding sustainability uh, in? Uh, uh, in, in the months to come, in the years to come. Uh, how, how worried should we be that these uh, perceived risks spill over and worsen the outlook for the region as a whole? So it, uh, I mean, definitely it's a, it's a reason for, for concern, but it really depends on how the region manages its, uh, its debt and how it is able to um, show itself to be transparent and, and sustainable uh, and in, uh, uh, in not only in managing its uh, risks, its fiscal uh, risks, but also risks related to natural disasters, for instance, climate related risks, um, for instance, those are the areas that I um, work in specifically and I, and I feel that um, Asian um, governments who are also focusing on those specific types of risks, especially those that are highly vulnerable, um, are um, going to see a lot of opportunities going forward. Mm -hmm. And if I may follow up also, because I think it seems to be also a, a question I find interesting and, and, and you most suited to answer perhaps, uh, in, particularly with regard to Cambodia and issuing a, a third, 300 million sovereign debt this year. this year. And the question I think if we generalize is, is it wise for countries to, play, to make small uh, placements first uh, rather, rather than larger ones, you know, more in accordance with their actual fiscal needs? Well, you know, countries should only issue the amount of debt that they need. Uh, if a country doesn't need a you know, large amount of financing, they, they shouldn't be issuing a bond. Uh, larger than that their financing needs. Um, of course, you know, if they are issuing an, uh, a euro bond, for, for instance, then they really need to look at, um, you know, the size of the, of the bond, uh, because, you know, investors um, uh, are uh, interested in liquidity, so they would want larger size bonds, so 300 million would be a minimum for US investors, it would be even, even bigger in size, but of course, you know, C Cambodia should make sure that they are not issuing a bond that is larger than their financing needs under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Farah. Uh, I see another question that is quite popular about interest growth differential. And, uh, you know, Marcelo, you, you mentioned that uh, the case of Japan may be replicable. Um, how is it for, for uh, emerging economies in this region still benefiting from negative interest growth differentials that drags down their debt ratios? Uh, is this strong enough a force still to keep debt ratios in check? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the uniqueness of Japan is that uh, the vast majority of the debt, I would say 95% of it, if I remember, is in local currency. And the interest rate that matters is the domestic market interest rate compared to uh, 
the growth rate of the economy. There is this temptation by emerging country governments to say, I will borrow abroad in foreign currency and grow faster, betting on exchange rate stability. Meaning you trading um, your access to market, but you trade out the stability of your debt, uh, the currency risk that you carry. This second risk is rarely priced. Um, and at the end of the day, it was causes most of sovereign defaults and sovereign distress. Um, and we see it now in several countries in the region that are struggling with that problem. So the temptation is to compare apples with oranges in the interest rate of borrowing abroad in foreign currency with my own growth rate, because there is no guarantee of the stability of the exchange rate. So that's, that's one concept I will put right there. Are there countries that have been growing faster than their real interest rate in domestic currency so as to make the debt burden actually uh, lower and lower as time passes by? Uh, even said at some point that in Japan, uh, the more debt you have is the more uh, revenue, if that's what we come to call it, that you get because the bigger the debt, the more differential of growth over interest, and therefore that's like a subsidy from your creditors to you. Do you believe that many countries have that? Well, sporadically, you can. You will find emerging markets that are growing, you know, almost double digits, where they are coming out of the commodity boom, or um, some kind of stop go on the aggregate demand side. But they are very rare. And it's not a good technique to lay out your medium, medium term data strategy. Uh, okay. I don't think we would do that. Thank you. I see that we are running late in time. We have a few minutes left. So maybe we can just very quickly, uh, Lily or, or anybody else, uh, do we anticipate? Uh, Asian countries seeking treatment under the common framework, and what what is the, uh, the the expectations there? Is the common framework uh, how is it developing? Do we do we see uh, limitations still in in its capacity to help countries uh, sort out creditor coordination and those issues, or are further steps required at this stage? Oh, Juan, I see you. I see you nodding. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I just want to echo the the um, the final sentences that that uh, you are uh, referring to, uh, Beno. I, I think two minutes, that, please. Yeah, I, I think a, a significant, a, a, an important challenge for the Common Framework to to evolve relates to the transparency and the efforts made uh, for the blo uh, the global uh, financial community to engage non-traditional lenders that have been, particularly in Asia, that have been growing even prior to the pandemic. So this has to do again with the design of the international financial architecture um, that really needs to accommodate these new realities that were emerging prior to the pandemic. And now with the high levels of data, it's becoming more important that uh, to, to broader the game and, and, and facilitate this, this coordination with non-traditional uh, lenders. And, and here the international financial institutions, uh, including the ADB, I think they have an important role uh, to, to play. And uh, hopefully with the lessons from the past, from the analytical uh, efforts to understand what should be done in the future, the IFS will be uh, up to this uh, challenge and, and contribute to the, the uh, reformulation of the international financial architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Um, we have come uh, to an end of our scheduled time. It, it was a rich and fruitful, fruitful discussion today. From the Asian Development Bank, we thank you, the audience, for your active participation. And thank you, Farah, Lily, Juan, and Marcelo, our panelists for today. Join us again on 8 March, Tuesday, for our next Asian Impact Webinar, when other experts will be discussing making big data work for economic assessment. 
at 4 p.m. Manila time, still via Zoom. Thank you very much. Goodbye.